Hello, folks, and welcome back to another episode of Are You a Fan? If you like the episode, give us a like, share, and follow. Okay, so, question for the week. Joker, what do you know about Spider-Man 2099? I know it's from the future, and that's a bad answer. <laughs> that is valid. <laughs> uh, that's kind of all I really knew. I knew he was, um, yeah, just, I knew him from video games, and he appears in, like, a couple episodes of Spider-Man cartoon. Yep, that's, that's about all I got. <laughs> Same. Well, folks, let's uh, get into the real world. So, Spider-Man 2099 is a fictional superhero character appearing in American comic books published by Marvel Comics. The character was created by Peter David and Rick Leonard in 1992. I have a feeling that's Lenardi. Lenardi? Oh, I see the eye. <laughs> so... Hopefully that one of those is correct. He's also a little bit younger than I was expecting too. Yeah, I wasn't expecting the nineties. I think. Oh, I do remember this was part of a whole. We get into why these he exists here. Makes sense. So Spider Man twenty ninety nine was one of the many Marvel characters to be reimagined for the Marvel twenty ninety nine comic book line. That would show future versions of classic Marvel characters living in the year 2099. Yeah. That was kind of... The 90s were a weird time where, like, everything was kind of getting future techie. Remember? It was because they were trying to revamp stuff to make sure they could keep going and not just be the same stale comic that's been for decades. Which I 100% am always down with. I remember there's a Gargoyles episode where they do, like, techno future stuff. Okay, so Spider-Man 2099 was first featured in a five-page sneak preview of the first issue of his then-upcoming series in the 30th anniversary issue of The Amazing Spider-Man. So it's a perfect timing for it. Right? Solid. So the Spider-Man 2099 series, uh, first issue would appear shortly afterward. When originally published, the Marvel 2099 stories were meant to depict the official future of the Marvel Universe a dystopian American governed by corrupt ma- uh, mega corporations with a number of cyberpunk elements. Cause yeah. I mean, we still have a thing for that, but cyberpunk was a huge thing in the nineties. It really <laughs> was. And it's making a comeback and I'm about that. So the character was originally designed by artist Rick Lenardi, uh, with Peter David brought onto the series as writer to flesh out the character's alter ego, Miguel O'Hara and supporting characters, which we got as a Hispanic character, folks. I think that was the only other thing I knew about him is that he wasn't Hispanic and wasn't white. I'm not going to lie until I did the research on this. I actually did not know he was a uh, Latino. Or Latinx. Wow, I know something that you don't. Yeah. That's I, rare. <laughs> I actually did not know. Especially either. about a Spider-Man comic. Right? I Like, I knew there are things we'll get into that I did know. I did not know he was Hispanic. So, Spider-Man 2099, issue number one, was written by P- Peter David, penciled by Rick Lenardi, and inked by Al Williamson, and later uh, lettered by Rick Parker. David named the character after his uh, friend, actor Miguel Ferrer? Ferrer? I have no idea who that is, and hopefully we're not butchering the name too much. Uh, Spider-Man 2099, issue number one, is the highest-selling single issue of any comic uh, written by Peter David. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I feel like that'd still be a cool thing to have. Yeah, heck yeah. So, although the book was uh, continuously selling more than 100,000 copies per issue... The book and entire 2099 comic line underwent a drastic shift in early 1996. And with the firing of the 2099 series editor, Joy, uh, Joey Cavallari, which... A very Italian name. Very. <laughs> also, ah, that, that's what, like, you know, it's one of those, I don't know what was going on behind the scenes, but always, it always kind of stinks when, like, Something's doing really well like that, and they're like, the company's like, yeah, we're gonna fire the main guy that's behind that. There's probably some good reason behind it, more than likely. But also, there could have been other issues with the other comics. This True. one, while this was doing good, the others may have been tanking. True. 
But also, you know, the fact it went for four years is still pretty impressive. Especially in the for the comic book universe, hundred yeah. Especially for a revamp. So it's still they still made a lot further than I think they could have. Or True. Maybe not than they could have, but they went further than I think most expected. True. So at this time, Marvel's finances and future were unstable. Uh, and sudden firings were quite common. Like virtually all of the other writers in the line, Peter David chose to show solidarity with his editor and resign from the book with issue number 44. Which is good. I mean, it's a good way to show that, you know, you won't just take a random firing. Yeah. Also, I kind of forgot, this was around the time when Marvel kind of, like, started to sell off a lot of its movie right ones because they were just running into so many financial issues with their studio, with anime coming over, with, like, just... They were a lot... It was a rough time for Marvel. Makes sense. Marvel turned the 2099 title over to fill-in writers and editors. The last two issues of Spider-Man 2099 were done without Peter David's input, and the series ended with issue number uh, 46. A few months later, Marvel announced that they would publish a new 2099 title, 2099 World of Tomorrow, immediately following the last issue of the original titles, and under the new staff. And this is where we get into why I think this, like, it's impressive how it lasts, how this character lasted. <laughs> the new bi monthly title lasted eight issues and was meant to serve as the finale for the 2099 line and at the end of its uh, regular publication. But wait, there's more. <laughs> Miguel O'Hara was seen again without a costume in the 1998 in 2099 Manifested Destiny, a one-shot issue intending to bring further closure to the 2099 line and its unresolved storylines. So the character has since made several cameo and guest appearances in such titles as Captain Marvel Volume 3, issues 27 through 30, which were also written by Peter David, and in Exiles 75 through 99, Marvel published a collected edition of the first 10 issues of the original series in April of 2009, and a second collection in October of 2013, uh, collecting up to issue number 14. So Spider-Man 2099 next appeared in the Superior Spider-Man issues 17 through 19 in September and October of 2013, while Miguel stranded in the mainstream Marvel timeline at the end of the story. So I just, I just, I do love that. They're like, we're going to end and wrap it up. And then they just keep bringing the character back. Well, so, I mean, they wrapped up the stories of the time. Yeah. You know, but it's, it's easy to still bring back characters with the cameos. Oh, yeah. And honestly, this character seems to be a fan favorite. So one of those, why wouldn't you create stories to keep bringing them back? <laughs> exactly. And with something with like a time skipping, time jumping, it's just an easy thing to shoehorn in. Oh, heck yeah. So the character and settings, uh, the character and setting were reimagined for the Time Storm in 2009 through 2099 four-issue limited series published from April to August 2009. Wow, that's confusing. <laughs> Although uh, bearing the Spider-Man 2099 moniker, it is a different version of the character. And here's where we get into dimension hopping. Uh, of course. In the 2013 Necessary Evil storyline, the superior Spider-Man, the character is stranded in the present. Ah, uh, that's when Doc Ock had his body. <laughs> <laughs> so in uh, July 2014, Marvel launched a second Spider-Man 2099 series with Peter David returning as writer, Will Sliné as artist, and Simon Bianchi. Bianchi? Bianchi. Illustrating the first issue's covers. Once again, we always apologize if we butcher names. And that's kind of what we got for Real World. And yeah, no, this is a character that just like won't won't stay dead with the main s- series. <laughs> he, I mean, at least, you know, he's got that easy way to be shoehorned around to keep him alive. Oh, yeah. So honestly, if it wasn't for that, he probably would have died with the rest of it. Probably. Also, it, like... It's weird because you would think Doctor Strange, but Spider-Man probably is the most prolific character for dimension hopping and stuff. Well, because they got to explain all the different spiders that they got. Yeah, but that's like how it started to happen. They're like, they're like, 
who, which character should we have have alternate versions of himself and timelines? And they're like, Doctor Strange? No. How about that kid from Brooklyn? But it makes sense because it's the easiest character to kind of change who he is and kind of help other groups get kind of that, that uh, brought to the forefront. True. So, so he's probably the easiest one out of all the comics to do that to. I just always have fun. I'm like, I'm like man, I have all the characters. <laughs> cracks me up so in universe so miguel o'hara no, miguel o'hara was born in new york city futuristically called nuava york nueva york no shit sure, not sure no cool <laughs> uh many years after the end of what his people's history called the heroic age which is the modern day era of marvel heroes of course all right so he grows up with his mother, Conchata, his younger brother, Gabriel, and his abusive father, George O'Hara. Because, of course, got to have the abusive parent somewhere. Right. Or family figure. Usually it's the father, but. Yeah, I feel like if, it, if they're. I feel, if it, it's the mother, they become villains. Yeah, we have <laughs> Every seen that. Every time. I think the only exception was uh, Captain Cold. But he, had, he was a villain. Yeah, but he had the abusive father. Okay, that's what you meant. That, that's what I meant. I think, I think the only one where we, exception with vill, villains yeah. was uh, he had the father one. But for the most part, yeah. Yeah, it's always a mother. And it's always the father for the heroes. I think it's like Scarecrow was uh, his, his mother or mother figure. Most of them, yeah, mother, grandmother. Yeah, some motherly <laughs> pay, which it's one of those like the with the writers. It's like, you guys trying to tell us something? I think so. <laughs> it's making me nervous about myself. Ah. <laughs> uh, a rebellious boy with prodigy level intelligence, Miguel is an adolescent when he is awarded enrollment into Alchemax School for Gifted Youngsters, heavily implied to be the renovated version of the X-Men's headquarters. In Westchester, owned by a powerful Alchemax mega corporation, which also controls local law enforcement agencies. Uh, of course. Yeah, we get, they get real big in the future about, like, corporations will run everything. And I'm just looking around like, I mean, they might have been on to something. I think they were. <laughs> <laughs> just starting a little earlier than they were hoping, I think. Right. So here he befriends Xena Kwan? Yep. Okay. That's what we're going with. That works. Uh, she's a girl of similar intelligence who specializes in computers. Uh, Xena helps Miguel defend himself against the bully Cron Stone and son of Tyler Stone, vice president of R&D for Alchemax. Because, of course, they got to make the mega corporation that much more of a villain. Right? Just add to it, man. It's like, it's like the villain villains while the villain villain. <laughs> Pretty much. As adults, Miguel and Xena date seriously until Miguel cheats on her with Donna D'Angelo, who originally is his girlfriend, uh, is a girlfriend of Miguel's brother, Gabe. Honestly, this is one of the few characters I think we've done. Like, he's a, he's up there with those characters where it's like, I get we're supposed to root for him, but this guy kind of sucks. Yeah. Just a bit. And not only is he cheating, but he's cheating with his brother's girlfriend. Yeah. That's like, even worse. Like, oh, man. Like, dude, did you, did you want us to like this character? No. Like, uh, I think they screwed that up. <laughs> yeah. Though seemingly arrogant and confident in all walks of life, Miguel is a very private man and trusts almost no one except for his apartment's uh, holographic aide, Lila, uh, an artificial intelligence programmed by Xena. Because, of course, that would make sense. Yeah. Also, just kind of sad. <laughs> just a lot. So, Miguel eventually becomes head of the genetics program of Alchemax intended to create new corporation uh corporation controlled superpower soldiers called corporate raiders <laughs> i don't know why that name cracks me up it just sounds so it, i don't know i like it i like oh, it. that sounds like the very generic hey we're trying to make this corporate look like bad guys it sounds <laughs> generic but it also i just think it's hilarious and fun <laughs> So Miguel is specifically inspired by surviving records concerning Spider-Man and hopes to one day create a similarly powered person. 
but after a human test subject dies during an early experiment, Miguel tells Tyler Stone he wishes to resign from Alchemex and discontinue his genetics research. And of course, rather than letting Miguel leave, Tyler would trick him into taking into taking Rapture, an addictive drug that genetically bonds to the user. They're really just trying to make these corporations worse and worse. Right. Also, the amount of like evil corporations or companies in these comic books or things that we talk about, could they have saved themselves so much more trouble if they just let the guy? Because like he's not going out to go against them. He's like, man, I just don't, I don't agree with this work, so I'm not gonna just go find employment elsewhere. If they just let him leave, probably would save a lot of heartache down the line. Uh, we know that now, yes, but at the time, you know. Mega corporations, they're thinking, you know, you're gonna leave. You could take this to one of our competitors. True. And especially with something like a mega corporation, it's gonna be hard not to be picked up by a competitor. True. I guess I also just like that's where I feel like it's I feel a disconnect where I'm like, any corporation would have had you sign so much legal paperwork and that's so you couldn't take your ideas elsewhere. They've been like, Hey, we'll set you up in a house somewhere if you never talk about this again. It's just like I don't know, I just crack up with like Real world versus in universe where they're like, we got to make them extra evil. Yep. Tyler reminds Miguel that only Alchemax is allowed to legally distribute this drug. So if O'Hara does not remain with the corporation, then Tyler must assume he is getting the drug from black market and will be forced to tell the police. Not wishing to be black, black, a blackmailed addict, Miguel recalls that he entered his own genetic code into his machine's databanks during the experiments, using it as a human DNA test sample. Bam, right there. So, intending to use the older template of his pure genetic code to write over his current biology and free himself from the rapture, Miguel sneaks into Alchemex and uses the gene alteration machine on himself. Because, you know, as a, a kid in the future, what better thought process? Yeah, right? Killed the last guy, but let's... I'm well, sm- it can't be much worse than being blackmailed into staying with a company you don't agree with. True. As dark as it is, True. it's kind of a win-win. Yeah, fair. You're not <laughs> you're, wrong. You're either not going to have to deal with them, or you're cured. And we have made, I have made that point in the past. I'm like, well, either, either all my problems are solved or all my problems are solved. <laughs> I can't blame him here. <laughs> uh, after Miguel turns on the machine to rewrite his DNA, his gel sub, uh, subordinate, Aaron Dalgado, sabotages the machine causing them to alter Miguel's genetic code to 50% spider DNA. Miguel survives the process, but realizes he now has spider abilities. Dun, dun, dun. See, if he just didn't sabotage it, he might have just saved his company a whole lot of trouble. Yeah, honestly, actually. <laughs> just like- so see, he's worse than the other guy. Right? <laughs> just watching, it's like, wait, wait, wait. Then the last guy die. Maybe I should just let this play out. Exactly. And if he doesn't, then you do something. Right? So realizing now that there's a, a person with abilities similar to Spider-Man, Tyler Stone ends, uh, sends agents to hunt this person. To conceal his identity while he fights his pursuers, Miguel dons a bodysuit with a mask that he once wore for the Mexican Day of the Dead Festival. Which is that kind of cool? That, that really is, actually. <laughs> It's kind of, an kind awesome. of explains where some of the aesthetics of the suit comes from. Right? A little bit. The suit's a little more brutal looking oh, than God, most yeah. spider suits. So Miguel chooses this costume in particular because it is the only clothing he has that is made from UMF. Unstable molecule fabric. Meaning is the only clothing he owns that will not be torn or shredded by the spider talons that now occupy his hands and feet which is another unique like he doesn't just stick to things the way regular spider-man is those are talons that let him grip i said he's a little more uh monstrous i guess yeah maybe it's because he's got the 50 percent so he's got a little bit more spider dna than the rest i mean i also like yeah it's gotta be that i also feel like they took heavy inspiration from the movie the fly probably and that just more like uh, let's. <laughs> That's all I got. 
So after seeing him operate in public, a group of Thorites, or worshippers of the Marvel hero Thor, come to believe that Miguel is the legendary Spider-Man back from the dead and is the harbinger of Thor's eventual return. That's fair. Yeah. You can't really blame him on that in this universe. Especially because I feel like I feel like Nordic mythology took a hard turn in the beginning of the reign of the heroes. Oh yeah. That like at this point in the future, they probably would think Spider Man is like a demigod. <laughs> so originally focused on finding a cure for his condition, Miguel's further adventures as Spider Man twenty ninety nine caused him to realize how ignorant of the world he was and how he had turned a blind eye to the oppressed and pain uh oppression and pain of uh i'm gonna start that all over probably a good idea okay so originally focused on finding a cure for his condition miguel's further adventures as spider-man 2099 caused him to realize how ignorant of the world he was and how he had turned a blind eye to the oppression and pain the corporations of the world had caused. Which, you know, it's one of those, grow up in a certain, certain lifestyle, like in a certain private, like if you're going to private school and that, you probably don't, especially if you're not wanting to have contact with the family because of an abuser in there, you probably lose sight of. Well, then if you're not really a part of the side that's being oppressed and you're dealing with it, you're probably not going to really notice, especially if that's what you already grew up in. Yeah. Like, if he was alive before, like, as it changed, he'd probably notice it. But if he grew up in the world of mega corporations already existing, he's not going to know any better. Yeah, true. So, I mean, it's fair that he probably turned the blind eye. Fair. So, he was also surprised at the effect uh, his presence has on the people who have been oppressed for so long. Particularly his own mother, who ironically also hates the man her eldest son has become, yet admires the exploit exploits of Spider-Man 2099. Because, you know, cliches. I was going to say, <laughs> it's like the opposite of Aunt May and Peter. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> and so after this, Miguel decides to embrace his identity as Spider-Man. Aww. So donning his costume, he publicly proclaims himself to be an enemy to all the Megacorps saying he will use his powers to fight for ordinary people against those in power who abuse their influence and authority. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah, you fight that power. <laughs> Do it. Woo. So later on, Miguel discovers that the arrogant scientist at Alchemex called uh, Jordan Boone is conducting virtual unreality experiments to create a doorway into another dimension. And, well, here's the dimension hopping. Uh, these experiments would lead to the release of two mysterious figures, the net prophet called, quote unquote, the prophet of Thor by the Thorites and a powerful megalomaniac called Thanatos. <laughs> <laughs> the net prophet becomes the new ally to Miguel. I'm loving the parallels here. <laughs> right. So since the net prophet is believed to be Thor's prophet, his association with Spider-Man 2099 leads more people to believe that Miguel's alter ego is the harbinger of Thor. In the time fly saga that occurs years later in Peter David's Captain Marvel series is revealed that the net prophet is actually the hero uh, justice John Roger Tension. And that Thanatos is a corrupt version of Rick Jones from, from Earth 9309. So the first major crossover of the Marvel 2099 happens when Miguel and Dana visit Alchemex's floating city, Valhalla, and are startled, startled to find by the sudden appearance of two men claiming to be Thor and Heimdall, respectively. I don't blame them. I'd be a little terrified yeah. of these two sounding like two dead people showing up on you. Yeah, a little bit uh, out of the blue. Uh, it is later discovered that Alchemax CEO Ava Avatar has transformed ordinary people into duplicates of the Asgardians in order to eliminate the rising influence of new superheroes over the public. Yeah, last time somebody did made a copy of Thor, he did not take it very well. You know, that went horribly wrong. Whew. So, by joining forces, Doom, uh, Ravage, Jake Gallows the Punisher, 
the X-Men and Spider-Man 2099 are able to de- defeat the fake Azir in Valhalla Falls. So are they like bringing another version of Ragnarok? <laughs> Actually, it sounds I mean, like... They destroyed Valhalla. Again? <laughs> <laughs> How many times do we have to do this, old man? Well, according to their stories, a lot. Okay, so uh, let's get into um, let's since it's coming gonna kind of be coming up uh, here soon with the uh, Spider Enter the Spider Verse. Let's get into in the comics meeting the real Spider Man. So, in 1995, one-shot Spider-Man 299 meets Spider-Man. Miguel and Peter Parker, the Spider-Man of the heroic age, find themselves having switched places, with Miguel waking up next to Peter's wife, Mary Jane, and Spider-Man finding himself in the future. (laughs) That's got to be trippy for both of them. I was going to say, yeah. Because, yeah, I think Peter's waking up by himself when he went to bed with his wife. (laughs) And then this dude who clearly is shown he doesn't trust anybody to get that close to him. Is now waking up next to them. (laughs) Yeah, that sounds horrible. Yeah, I wouldn't be a fan of that. So they discover that their predicament is caused by... Fujikawa in the modern age and Alchemex in the year 2099 were running experiments on a temporal energy generator. Because, of course, they have two companies doing the same thing at different times. Right. Ah, corporations. So, while Peter tackles the Vulture in 2099, Miguel faces Venom, Eddie Brock, um, back in his age. Miguel realizes... That this temporal anomaly is what will cause the end of the heroic age. Since, uh, since where he is in the past is when the his- history tells him all the heroes and much of Earth's culture and technology were wiped out. Oh, well, that's cool. You get, get to see it firsthand. And realize that you were probably part of the cause. <laughs> oh, that's going to suck. Right? <laughs> So the two Spider-Man characters were united to face a major cause of the chaos, a time-traveling female hobgoblin of the year 2211, which was Robin Bourne, uh, from the alternate universe of Earth 9500. They they are aided by this hobgoblin's father, Spider-Man, Max Bourne, and eventually everyone is sent back to their respective times. You gotta love that not only are they time hopping in the same one issue, they're also dimension hopping in the same issue. Oh man, they're man. really trying to make this whole series confusing, right? Which, oh man, that's kind of. I want to read it, but I'm like, oh, that sounds like a lot. It sounds like a lot, yeah, especially yeah, at this point. <laughs> Okay, well, let's get into powers and abilities. So, superhuman strength, agility, and reflexes, along with stamina, which, you know, to be expected, he's a Spider-Man. He basically, he's half half Spider, really, now. So, he also has superhuman speed. O'Hara can run and move at speeds that are beyond the natural physical limits of the finest human athletes. Um, accelerated decoy allows O'Hara to move so fast that he can leave behind a body double double for enemies that attack him. Shadow clone jutsu. <laughs> Spider clone jutsu. <laughs> uh, so he also possesses uh, telepathy, which is very unique for a spider man. Uh, Miguel O'Hara shows to be able to communicate with others on a telepathic level. The full limits of his telepathy has yet to be explored. However, he's shown to easily communicate with others. It is believed that his telepathy is an extension of his spider sense manifesting in a different way. Because, yeah, it, uh, I did see some other things. I guess he technically is one of the few Spider-Men or Spider-People that doesn't actually have a spider sense. So, you know, no danger, but he can talk, he can talk to you through his mind. So that's a cool trade-off. Uh, superhuman durability, telescopic and night vision, which that's kind of cool. His vision also gives him the ability to see energy waves. And that's so like, I imagine that would allow like infrared or like, you know, laser grids or whatever. 
uh, regeneration. He can, you know, regenerate. Um, he has like a healing factor, just kind of like the regular Spider-Man. Uh, advanced longevity. Miguel O'Hara's a- uh, ages at a very slow rate due to the rapid regeneration of healthy bodily tissues and cells, which that's kind of a cool thing that even the regular Spider-Man don't have. So he also has talons and fangs. So O'Hara possesses elongated canine teeth that secrete a uh, paralyzing, though non-toxic, venom. He also possesses short, retractable talons at the tip of his fingers and toes that he uses to dig into surfaces, enabling him to crawl along them as a spy as a spider mite the talons are also razor sharp and capable with his great strength are able to rend materials as durable as cinder block that's impressive also (laughs) he has organic webbing so also genius level intellect skill to -to hand-to-hand combatant um, amazing computer skills which i feel like in the tech world and that to be smart, you'd have to have like some pretty decent computer skills. And that also uh, marksman, uh, marksmanship. Uh, Spider Man was able to hit a hostile holding a hostage multiple times with a pistol, with a bullet only grazing the hostage. Oh, there's all the Spider Man who don't care about guns, apparently. <laughs> cool. It's always a nice change of pace when you got a hero that's willing to use them. Yeah, no, I I agree. I'm just like I'm like, oh yeah, I forgot this this guy out here capping people. <laughs> so optical photo sen- Oh yeah, let's get into his weaknesses. Optical photosensitivity because of his night vision and telescopic view, and that basically a flashbang could ruin this dude's day. Uh, Man, they're gonna ruin anybody's day. <laughs> fair. He also like the way he gets around it because like even just regular bright lights will mess with him. And his eyes are a tone of red. So when he walks around the day, he has to wear sunglasses. Kind of, kind of almost like Cyclops a little bit there. Yeah. So also speech difficulty uh, with the cane, large canines. Those are not retractable for him. Uh, the Matt ones is teeth. Yeah, his teeth ones. Those don't go up, in and out, though. So that's just a constant burden. Uh, concentration. Although Miguel's talons are retractable, he needs to maintain constant mental and physical concentration to keep them retracted within his fingertips. This can cause problems should the should his focus be disrupted while hold, holding onto objects or people. Don't let him hold the baby. <laughs> Spinneret blockage. So if somebody's holding on to his wrists too tight or clamped something down on them too tight, he can't shoot webs. Which I feel like that's a kind of a weakness for the regular one if somebody grabs his wrist too tight and breaks the web shooters. That makes sense, yeah. So I'm like, I'm like, I feel like that's a shared weakness. He also possesses post-traumatic stress disorder. Following the attack on uh, Bijak's restaurant and... Uh, tapas bar miguel developed a post-traumatic stress disorder that the sight of an image of the truck that crashed into the restaurant bar triggers a brief anxiety attack i feel like there's a very niche weakness (laughs) yeah but also kind of like the pdsd in general isn't it but like it having to be oh it'd suck if that was the standard truck (laughs) essentially (laughs) Just like not a tricked out one, just like that's your. You walk outside, you're like, no. It's just a Ford F one fifty. Yeah. There's this basic truck that you see every day. Like, because otherwise, I'm like, that sounds like a real niche. Like, like, like it'd show up at the raw. Like you were in the wrong place, wrong time, and you lost to a bad guy because you <laughs> happened to see the exact truck. Oh, that'd be horrible. Uh, Spider Man 2099's original suit is made of an unstable. M- of unstable molecules. The only clothing he owned that could resist the tearing from his claws, the costume also includes a light air foil on its back. This foil emits a low concentration of anti-gravity particles that allow O'Hara to glide on on currents of the air. Which, that's kind of cool. I always wondered how he did that, because I remember seeing, like, 
stills of him flying. Yeah. So I always wondered what that was. That makes sense now. It really does. So, into his other media, in TV, a series was considered in 1999, but was not developed due to Batman Beyond premiering earlier that year, which is oh. kind of sad to think about. Yeah, but I get it. <laughs> yeah, they're like, because it was like, yo, they already just uh, covered so much of that ground. It's like, well, I guess, yeah, you can't have two futuristic cartoons at the same time. Oh, that's so sad, but like, yeah, I'm like... But oh. in the end, because the people who were going to make that in the, instead went and developed Spider-Man Limited. Oh. So it kind of worked out and they still made something, just not quite what they originally went for. Okay. <laughs> Which he would still appear in a four-part episode of Spider-Man Unlimited. So they still kind of got him. <laughs> I'm not really trying Because I've seen Spider-Man Unlimited. I'm trying to remember when he shows up. I don't remember what the episodes were. <laughs> So, in the film, he appears in the post credit scene of Spider-Man Into the Universe, voiced by Oscar Isaac, where Oscar will also reprise his role in the sequel, Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse, that comes out later this year. Nice. Kind of sad that that's all he's in. Right? I do know he shows up in the Ultimate Spider-Man uh, cartoon. I think you're thinking of Unlimited. Yeah, because Unlimited was another one that came out that was more... They end up on a different planet. That's yeah. where I'm like... So he wasn't credited with anything else. Am I mixing up the names or I did think they you mix are. up the names? I think you are. I'm going to look this up <laughs> I later. wouldn't be surprised. So in video games, he was said to appear in Marvel 2099, One Nation Under Doom, until it was canceled mid-development. He does appear in Marvel Super Hero Squad, Spider-Man Shattered Dimension, Spider-Man Edge of Time, Marvel Future Fight... And Lego Marvel Superheroes 2. And his black and white suits are alternate costumes for the main character in Marvel Spider Man of 2018. Oh. Which was, I mean, granted, they had a lot of random suits in that game, so none of them really felt out of place. Fair. But they all did at the same time. Fair. And, uh, well, I guess we ask the question we ask every week. You a fan, Joker? Yeah, I mean, he was always kind of seemed like a cool looking Spider Man, so I was always kind of curious about him, but I'm not willing to go through the effort of buying these comics and trying to find them all. It's one of those I enjoy, like, cyberpunk stuff, so I always kind of like liked the character. Never really got to know much about him until now, and honestly, heck yeah, I'm a fan. For anyone that's still listening, if you got something out of this, enjoyed the episode, or even liked the character before from a movie, comic, cartoon hell even that t-shirt that you saw one time you're a fan too if you want to jump on this train why not subscribe and share with a friend dick rail out y'all keep riding them rails